we all need a job. Look, in this economy, right, how important it is to have a job to pay the bills. There is nothing as devastating as being fired from a job because you're black, because you're a woman, because you're Muslim, or because you're gay. In 2010, Andre Cooley was working as a corrections officer for juvenile detainees for the Forest County Sheriff's Department in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. I mean, I just wanted to become a corrections officer because it would give me the opportunity to give back through the service. Considering where I came from and where I am today, I was the first person in my family to graduate from a four-year university. And so that really meant a lot because there are a lot of children coming behind me and I want to be a role model for them as well. After a domestic dispute with his boyfriend, the sheriff's department found out that he was gay. On the day of the incident, me and my boyfriend, we were, we were at my house, and uh, he became violent, and I called for help. And uh, when I called for help, uh, the local police and the sheriff's department responded to the call. And uh, when they responded, um, my boyfriend outed me to my boss. The sheriff's department fired Andre. With the help of the ACLU, he filed a lawsuit alleging discrimination based on sexual orientation. It's a risk any place, but in Mississippi, it's certainly a big risk to announce to the world, I'm gay, in a very public way, which is what he had to do when he brought this case. It's not something that I just hid, it just wasn't discussed. When I got hired, they weren't looking at the fact that I was gay. It was looking at my resume and the fact that I had been to school and and that I came from foster care and that, and that I was trying to make a difference. And so they were very impressed with that. And so it's like, you will be a very good fit for the job. And, and then like when everything came out, it's like, oh, you're fired. And I'm like, why? Researchers are studying whether cases like Andre's are isolated or more widespread. At the nationally recognized Williams Institute at UCLA, survey research has revealed the extent of the problem. According to the best data that we have available, the Williams Institute estimates that there are over seven and a half million lesbian and gay and bisexual workers in the U.S. labor force today. There are consistent research findings of very high levels of discrimination against LGBT people. When asked in surveys, LGB people report ranges of discrimination from 10 to 50 percent, depending on whether they're asked about harassment or are being fired. When you survey transgender people, the level of discrimination is even higher. There is no uniform federal law in the United States on discrimination against LGBT people in the workplace. The Equal Employment Opportunity Commission is a federal agency charged with enforcing existing employment anti-discrimination laws. High Feldblum, an out lesbian, is one of the commissioners of the agency. We are the first step anytime someone feels that they have been discriminated against in employment. So that's race, sex, religion, color, national origin, age, disability, and genetic information. On these bases, you can't fire someone, refuse to hire them, treat them differently in employment. We have not finished our civil rights journey in terms of employment, and we clearly need a explicit law, as President Obama has said, that would prohibit discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. And when that law gets passed, it's again this agency that's going to be responsible for implementing it. Because there is no federal legislation, a limited number of states have passed anti-discrimination laws. So there's still a majority of states in the United States where it's legal to fire someone because of their sexual orientation or gender identity. And even in those states that do have laws, the coverage uh, of these state laws varies from state to state um, and in some cases doesn't provide adequate protection. Uh, for example, most, most laws do not include protections for transgender people. Often the remedies are not as strong as we want them to be. Sometimes they don't have attorney's fees attached to it, so you might have a right, but if you can't find a lawyer to represent you, it's hard to get a remedy. Sometimes they don't cover a lot of employers, so it's very much of a patchwork. Although Mississippi has no state law protecting LGBT workers, Andre was fortunate enough to fall within one of those patchwork rules because he worked for the Sheriff's Department 
a local government entity. Public employees really don't know they have rights because there's not a statute that says it. There's not a law you can look up in the books that says you're protected. It's, you know, the protection is really based on constitutional issues and case law. A public employer can't just put a policy in place, take an action um, based on what's called unanimous. They can't say, we don't like this. We don't like it that you're gay, and so we're going to fire you. After Andre filed his lawsuit, the Sheriff's Department reversed its decision and took Andre back. I'm basically just glad to be back because I really like the job and the people in this area. I'm not going to say that going back isn't going to have its challenges, but uh, the Sheriff's Department has made a lot of changes. I think that that's going to make transitioning back into the position a lot easier. Uh, and so, I mean, I I'm very optimistic about going back. When you work for the government, you thankfully do have the Constitution that is protecting you. I mean, that's why the ACLU can bring a suit against a sheriff's office in Mississippi. But remember, the federal Constitution applies only to government action. In the private sector, we need to have legislation. In the absence of protective laws, progress has come from a surprising source, corporate America. Bill Hendricks is a scientist working for Dow AgroSciences in Indianapolis, Indiana. Dow, being a middle America company that doesn't sell directly to consumers, you might think wouldn't be overly supportive of their LGBT employees, but that's not the case at all, and I found it to be quite the opposite. We hire a lot of scientists, and it's difficult to find good scientists, period. And why would you ever want to go out and exclude part of that population? It doesn't make sense. And so the company early on understood the business case of that. Dow has, over the last 10 years, implemented a whole range of policies and procedures and benefits that are absolutely equitable to all employees, be that for same-sex couples or opposite-sex couples. It's one and the same. Specifically speaking about transgenders, we've got a new benefits program that allows people to elect various different procedures, processes that they wish to take, changing gender. Gender programs, hormones, uh, counseling, all sorts of things like that. Dow's LGBT-friendly policies came about after employees took the initiative to form an employee resource group and push for rights internally. In 1999-2000, a group of employees got together and realized that we didn't have protections in our EEOC statement that would protect our gay and lesbian employees from being fired. They brought that to the attention of the CEO, and that really formed that basic group of GLAD, Gays, Lesbians, and Allies at Dow, our employee resource group. Different companies call them different things, a business network, an employee resource group. But they're basically ways for LGBT people to get together, find one another, and begin to organize within their company for domestic partner benefits, for having the right policies in place. They've been really the catalyst for change on so many levels within corporate America. I didn't come out until they formed the network. And then I watched for like a year or two to see what they were doing, just to make sure that they weren't rubber stamping things. And once I recognized that they were actually um, serious about it and wanting to change the environment, then I, then I joined the network. Like most companies, you know, we had to um, grow into it, if you will, um, and to get our legs underneath us. So it was a lot in the beginning of putting together the basic sort of business case foundation. But then as time has gone on and the company saw the benefits of supporting uh, the LGBT employee, it really made, I think, the company feel more comfortable in stepping up to be an out front leader. We're basic chemical business at a very middle America kind of place. If we can make it work, I think any company can make it work, and we're proof of that. Today, the majority of Fortune 500 companies put sexual orientation in their EEO policies. To 40% include gender identity. Over half of Fortune 500 companies now offer domestic partner benefits. Because there is no federal law to protect the LGBT community from, the work, uh, from discrimination, um, it's important for the companies to do that work themselves. During a conversation with my boss, he said, well, one day you'll find a husband and marry, get married and have all sorts of kids, a house. And I said, I'm not going to have a husband. And he, you know, kind of went red faced on me. And I said, well, I'm going to have a wife. He's like, OK, well, a wife, a house, you know, kids and cars. And 
it kind of eased up the situation and I've never been happier. As an out employee, and I have always felt much more open about who I am in my work environment than say in my other environments at, at home and in other places because of the way the state is. The state of Indiana has no protection for LGBT workers in the private sector. Indiana also does not recognize same-sex marriage and is moving to ban civil unions and possibly domestic partnerships. We have protections from eight to five that I don't have once I leave the gate. Dow has facilities in a lot of smaller communities that don't offer protections to LGBT employees. It's a sad state of affairs and I'm better protected inside the Dow gate than the second I leave and try and go home. That state of affairs has prompted Bill and Dow to take the fight for employment equality to Congress. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, my name is Bill. The proposed Andrew. federal law that would protect LGBT workers is the Employment Non-Discrimination Act, or ENDA. ENDA is really the successor bill to the gay civil rights bill that was introduced in the mid-70s. I, I don't think many of us have a lot of expectations that it can pass in this current Congress, but there's still a lot of work to do on it, and I know a lot of us are very anxious to educate all these new members of Congress so that when it can pass, we've done our work and educated people. One of the things about civil rights laws is it protects you being who you are. It doesn't require you to hide. Once there is a law that says you can't discriminate based on sexual orientation, that also means you can't fire someone because they have a picture of their husband, the male guy with the male husband, on the desk, right? Or if I had pictures of my partner and kids that it allows people to breathe. I mean, my personal beliefs on it are, I mean, people should be free to, you know, be, I mean, who they are and be accepted as a part of, you know, having a diverse workplace, because I mean, most workplaces, you know, they, they say, you know, we embrace diversity, but do we? Thank you for watching In The Life. To learn more about the issues in tonight's program, or to tell us your thoughts about the show, text ITL to 69866 on your mobile phone. And visit itlmedia.org to watch our web exclusive on transgender discrimination, injustice at every turn. As we shine a light for the world to see, and no one deserves to be bound by disease. So don't you give up hope, that's where I plant my seed. So hold my hand and speak for all you want. It won't last, H-I-V. It won't last. Too much more.